This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Feeling for flaws. Yes, she decided, her eyes sparkling at her granddaughter. A good one. Is it ready? Gagat, said Nokomis. Surely. Nokomis's tobacco pouch was decorated with blue and white beads in the shape of a pipe. She had owned this tobacco bag ever since Amakeas could remember. When she talked to the Manitous, Nokomis dipped out a pinch of tobacco. Old sister, she said to the birch bark tree, we need your skin for our shelter. At the base of the tree, Nokomis left her offering, sweet and fragrant. Then she peered closely, deciding just where to make the first cut. Suddenly, she pressed her razor-sharp knife into the bark. Omakea stepped back. Light filtered golden and green onto their faces. Tiny white flowers poked out of dead leaves. There were still traces of grainy old snowbanks in the shadiest spots, but in places the sun was actually hot. Pow! As soon as Grandma made the proper cuts, the birch bark, filled with spring water, nearly burst from the tree. Omakeas helped her grandmother carefully push the bark aside, then the two peeled it away, strip by strip. She and Omakeas carried the light, papery pink-brown rolls out of the woods, down a trail to a special place near the water. Here they set up the birch bark house. Damp ground made Nokomis's old bones ache, so she spread out her brown cattail mat and sat down there to sew those pieces of bark together. Omakeas helped her, threading the tough basswood strands through holes punched by Grandma's awl. Meanwhile, Mama and Omakeas's older sister tied together a frame of bent willow poles. Finally, as the light faded, they fastened the mats of bark onto the willow frame, a half-skeleton of pliable saplings. The bark mats overlapped like shingles to shed the rain. Each one was secured to the next, so as not to blow off in a storm. When the house was swept out, smoothed, fussily arranged and admired, they moved in. The children, Omakeas's brother Little Pinch, Baby Niwo, Omakeas's older sister, Pretty Angeline, and Omakeas herself spread their blankets around the stone fire pit. Mama and Nokomis hung the smoky woven bags of rice and tools and medicines from the willow poles above. Omakeas's family were Anishinaabeg, and this was their island. Her father, her Dede, was in the fur trade business, which meant that he was often gone paddling the great canoes for the fur company, or sometimes trapping animals himself. Yellow Kettle, her mother, was quick-tempered, but always laughing, and her eyes shrewdly took in the world. Yellow Kettle was a strong-looking woman, and beautiful. Her smile was generous, enigmatic, slightly crooked, and kind. She missed nothing when it came to her children. It was impossible to hide a half-done job, ridiculous even to think of sneaking away in the morning before gathering wood for the fire and water for her cooking pot. And if Mama didn't notice the younger children's whereabouts, Omakeas's older sister, Angeline, surely would. Angeline was smart and so pretty, people turned in their tracks to stare at her. Her hair was thick, her hands clever. The beads in her designs were laid down in strict rows. Her stitches never faltered. Her steps, when she walked or danced, were clear and graceful. She was so perfect that Omakeas despaired. Still, she hoped that she herself would turn out like Angeline, and was sometimes embarrassed to find herself following at Angeline's heels like a puppy. Most of the time, Angeline was kind to Omakeas and let her tag along and admire from a distance. But there were also times her words were sharp as bee stings, and at those times, Omakeas shed tears her sister never knew or probably even cared about, 
for as very beautiful people sometimes are, Angeline could be just a little cold-hearted at times. Omakeas's little brother Pinch was the only really big problem in her life. The sad truth was, and she couldn't tell this to a single person, Omakeas didn't like little Pinch. She thought there was something wrong with him. So greedy, so loud. But although his ways were mischievous and bold, Pinch loved his mother deeply, and he clung to her side. In fact, he took up all her attention even more than the baby. He clutched Mama's skirts with fat, tough little fingers. He yelled at Omakeas if she was slow in giving up her willow doll, her little rock people, or anything else for that matter, including food, special pieces of driftwood she found, even her favorite sleeping place near Grandma. He thought he deserved everything. At least when it came to Niwo, there was nothing to complain about. He was so sweet that Omakeas often pretended that he was her very own baby. Of course. She hardly ever got to hold him, for he was still very young. Still, she was sure he preferred her to Angeline, and certainly to Pinch. Sometimes he even held his arms out to her when Mama was holding him, and yelled with delight when Omakeas picked him up. As it grew dark, the family ate macaques of moose stew and fresh greens and berries. Licked their fingers and bowls clean, and at last rolled themselves into warm, fluffy rabbitskin blankets that still smelled of the cedary smoke of their winter cabin. They were glad to be close to fire, sleeping on soft grassy earth, under leafy sky, and best of all, near water. They fell asleep to the peaceful, curious, continual lapping sound of waves. The fresh wind across the big lake blew away the smoke of cooking fires and vanquished the mosquitoes that came out in whining droves and had plagued them in town. It was good to sleep where the village dogs didn't bark all night, and where the only sound to disturb their dreams was the pine trees sifting wind in a lulling roar. Unless, of course, it stormed. The moon went down to a fingernail sliver, and the corn popped from the ground. The leaves of the birch grew big enough to flutter in the wind, and then one night, the first storm of the summer struck the island and startled everybody from their dreams. The fire was down to red winking eyes when Omakeas woke with an uneasy feeling. Something approached. She felt a footstep. Omakeas was always the one to sleep near Grandma, and now she rolled close. There was a lonely insistence to the sound of the wind, and then everything went still. Far off, she heard one huge footstep. There was a long silence. Then another step fell. The earth shook slightly beneath her, vibrated as though she lay on the head of a vast drum. A drum. She remembered that Grandma had said the island was the drum of the thunder beings. Closer and closer they came, shaking earth with their footsteps. Omakeas's lonely feeling became fright. She hid her face and tried not to think of balls of witch fire or the hooting of Grandfather Owl. She tried to keep herself from picturing pakugs. The skeletons of little children flying through the woods, or the icy breath of giant windigos striding over the ground, cracking trees off with every foot crunch. Another step, another, and another fell, and then the wind howled to life. Rain slashed against the tightly sewn walls. A breath of air stirred up the slumbering coals and cast shadows leaping and fighting on the inside walls of the little birch bark house. The willow poles trembled, bouncing with the force of the gusts of wind. The birch bark scraped and flapped, but was held on with tight stitches. Omakeas hid her face as thunder rolled, smacking onto the lake shore, waking everything and everyone with its quick violence. The storm punished the ground and then passed over, 
dying off in softer mumbles. The dull thuds of thunder falling in the distance now felt comforting.